started six years ago and found a lifeline of community that encouraged her to seek God more fully in a demanding season of life. Sunny park afternoons and day trip adventures with her three kids sparks joy in her life. When she's not on mom duty, she enjoys exercise and bottomless cups of coffee with her husband. She lives in Danville with her husband, Gary, who you also saw in the highlights picture and her three kids ages six, four, and one. So definitely really excited to have Amanda here. All right. So I unmute myself, right? Yeah. Hey, this is a new format for me. You got this. <laughs> I'm trying to decide if I should like make a gallery view or I think we're good. I can see Mitzi. I can see Holly. I can see lots of pieces. Jesse, I see you. My mom dialed in. Um, I'm going to start us off in prayer this morning. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Um, I'm going to start us off in a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time together and that you've created an avenue for us to still gather from our own homes. And God, I ask you to just Bless my words today. Let my words be your words. And God, I ask that each and every woman who's dialed in or who is hearing this on YouTube, that they take one little nugget of truth about who you are and what you want them to hear they hear today, Lord, because that's all that matters, God. And bless our time together. Bless our discussions. In your precious and name we pray. Amen. Okay. Michelle said, Isaiah. 13 through 27. That is a huge chunk of scripture. So we're going to break it down just a little bit. Um, Yay, now we can see you, Amanda. We couldn't see you. Now we can see you. Oh, now you can see me. No, well, we heard you, but I think now you're spotlighting. Can everyone else see Amanda now? Because I couldn't see her. We, we can when we you're not you. talking. Got it. I'm going to mute myself then. <laughs> okay. So a few weeks ago, I'm not on Zoom very often unless it's for kindergarten. So um, a few weeks ago or a few months ago, Mitzi got the leadership team together over Zoom and we were just checking in and talking about the challenges of parenting during a pandemic. And Holly Casserly, whom you've all know, um, actually I don't think she's taught yet this year, but she said something so profound and I thought about it over and over again over the last two months. She said, right now during this season, our children need us to be a soft rock for them to land on. And I about sunk like two inches back in my chair because I was like, oh my gosh, I am not a rock. I am a cactus and I am prickly and I am grouchy and I feel frumpy and I am not a soft rock. I'm not approachable. And I felt so convicted. And so for the last two months, I've been praying, God, like give me patience, help me be this soft rock, help me be a little less intense. And then as I was preparing this teaching for you, by no coincidence, I'm sure, Isaiah uses the analogy of God as our rock twice. And I realized I was asking the wrong question. I was asking myself, where do I become a rock? But instead I should have asked, who is my rock? Who is my rock so that I can be a rock to my children and to my family. And that's our big idea today is that God is your rock now, even during this really weird yucky time now, so we can trust him in the later. We have to let God be our now and later. Do you guys remember those candies? I went to two stores looking for now and later for this talk. I couldn't find any, but I did find some high chews. So here's your visual, just pretend that this says now and later, those are those candies that were really, really chewy and they lasted forever. And they were super sweet. And we need to think about God that way. He is our rock now. He is our sweet treat at the end of a hard day. He is our sustenance, if you can call candy sustenance, right? He is our protector. He is able. He is our ally. And because of all those things, because of who he is, we can trust him in the later. And the later is first and foremost our salvation. And then second, also our earthly circumstances. We can trust him tomorrow, next month, two years from now. We can trust him in that. So where are we? We're gonna explore this concept um, together. I'm gonna kind of jump over chapters 13 through 24. In a nutshell, 
Isaiah has prophesied complete and utter, utter destruction of the entire world. And then we see complete and utter destruction of the world because he is unhappy with how people, Israelites included, have broken his covenant with them and have disobeyed him. But then we see in chapters 25 and 26, some hope. Now these two chapters we're gonna hone in on today, these are um, songs of praise to the Lord, songs of praise. And they remind us that, yes, there will be destruction, but the Lord will preserve, protect his people. First and foremost, the Israelites, but also those who turn to him in faith and humility. So we're included in that, in his people here. So if you have a Bible in front of you, I want to jump into chapter 25, verse 1. I'm just going to read to you verses 1 through 5. Remember, these are songs of praise. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name, for in perfect faithfulness you have done marvelous things, things planned long ago. You have made the city a heap of rubble, the fortified town a ruin. The foreigner's stronghold, a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will, peoples will honor you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in, in his distress, a shelter for the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall and like the heat of the desert. You silence the uproar of the foreigners. And then it's on the same page, jump, jump to chapter 26. We're just going to look at verse 26, uh, chapter 26, verse four. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord. The Lord is the rock eternal. So the things that jump, jump out to me there is that the Lord is what? He is a shelter. He is a shade. He is a cloud. These are all really approachable things, right? And this is our first point, right out of chapter 26, verse four. The Lord is the rock eternal. Let God be your rock. He is our shelter. He is our shade. He is our cloud. All throughout the Old Testament, uh, David in particular uses the analogy of God as our rock, right? What is a rock? A rock is stable solid, immovable. You could hide from enemies behind a rock. And as I read this, I thought to myself, so where do I need and where do we need shelter from in our lives right now? What's the first thing that pops up into your head? I want you to think about that for a second. And then I want to call it the elephant in the room, which was the elephant in the room for me. Well, yeah, it's so easy to say, Amanda, yeah, God is our rock. God's our rock. But how do you feel that when you're stuck in a really hard 2 to 3 p.m. in your house in the rain with your kids, right? We find the answer to that in God's word. In Psalm 31, we hear David. You don't need to flip to it. I'll read it to you. It's short. We get a little glimpse of how we can allow God to be our rock. David says, in Psalm 31, verse two, turn your ear to me, come quickly to my re rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. So in the first verse, David says, be my rock. And then immediately in the second verse, he says, you are my rock. So essentially what he's saying to the Lord is, be to me who you are. I've chosen you to be my rock. So therefore you are my rock. See, we let God be our rock. We praise him for being it. And the more and more we do that, the more and more we choose him, the more our mental knowledge of who he is will line up with how we're feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. How we're feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. I know that in order to let God be my rock so that I can be a rock for my family, I have to do a couple of things, especially during the pandemic. Um, I need some structure. So the day has to be relatively structured with my three children, um, or at least a loose plan. I need sleep. 
I need adequate food. I need some sort of community with other women who are walking with the Lord. I have a weekly um, six foot apart trail run I do with one of my good friends. Um, if I don't have those things, I'm hopeless in seeking the Lord. I just kind of spiral down more so than ever. Um, and so I want you to think about what that, what you answered when I asked you what you need shelter from. And I, I encourage you to give that to God in prayer and to praise him and know that he is your rock and he wants to be your rock for you. And then also think about the things that you need in order to set yourself up, stack the deck for yourself to seek him more during what is a very strange year. So moving on to chap, uh, still in chapter 25, we're just going to skip a couple of verses, like two verses. And we're in chapter 25, verse seven. I just love this. He says, Isaiah says, on this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all of the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So Isaiah has spent so much of the book so far talking about the city that will come to ruin and death and destruction. And then he says at this feast, he's providing an analogy to a feast. That's a verse that we skipped, but he says, God will destroy death. And in so doing, he will prove his holiness and his sovereignty and that he is the one true God. This is really important for us and allowing God to be our rock right now because it reframes our entire perspective, right? Why is it important that death was conquered? See, if life is hard and, and we have nothing else but what we have right now, then what we do right now doesn't really matter. And if right now is hard, we're pretty hopeless because we have nothing else but the experiences that we're living right now. You know, my parents, um, they moved recently and their neighbors next to their house for Christmas had um, a sign on their or Christmas lights on their roof and it spelled out 2020 sucks. I'll say stinks in case there's kids around you, but it says 2020 stinks on their Christmas light display. Every time I drove past it, I was kind of like, oh, you know, like it's funny. Yeah, I get it. Like you're calling out the elephant in the room. And then as I prepared this talk, I thought, I figured out what was bothering me about that. It was the people with those Christmas light display, they got the now. They were calling out the now, but what they were missing was the later. They were missing the now and later. And this is our second point today. Even when things stink, we have to rejoice in Jesus. See, God created us for abundant life with him. And he created us for now and for later in eternity with him because of Christ's death at the cross for us to make us right with our heavenly father, to bring us into rich relationship with him, to make us righteous in his eyes. We get to spend eternity with our heavenly father. And so right now, even though that stinks, we can rejoice in what we're getting later. Letting God be our now and later. Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm going to paraphrase, um, verse 55, he says, death has been swallowed up. He's quoting Isaiah here. He says, oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? We have to reframe our minds to the leader. God has already proven his trustworthiness to us in his son, Jesus. And then, so what do we do about that? Verse nine is, it's beautiful. Let us rejoice. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. I read that and I thought, how much, so, how much rejoicing have I done lately? It's hard. But right here, God tells us, let us rejoice. 
I know that this has been a really hard year for many people and it's been overwhelming and we need to hold tight to the, the truth that our story, that this circumstance that we're in, it, it, this is not our conclusion, right? We know our story's conclusion in Jesus. And I don't wanna make it sound quaint or, or super easy, but I have to remind us like, what did David do when things were hard? or when he wanted God to be something for him. He said, be to me who you are, right? Lord, be my rock. Jesus, be my salvation. This reframe is so important. I'm gonna skip us down to verse 26, or chapter 26, verses seven through 10. Still songs of praise to the Lord. It says, the path of the righteous is level. O oh, upright one, you make the way of the righteous smooth. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and renown are the desires of your heart, of our hearts. My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. When the judgments come upon the earth, people of the world learn righteousness. Though grace is shown to the wicked, they do not learn righteousness. Even in the land of uprightness, they go on doing evil. They go on doing evil. I love verse seven. It says, the path of the righteous is level. Oh, upright one, you make the way of the righteous smooth. And I read that and I thought, well, I want a level path. So am I righteous? And the answer is there's no righteousness apart from Jesus. So if we have chosen, if you have chosen Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are made righteous. You are made right in the eyes of God, in character, nature, attitude, and action. Righteousness is an attribute of God. And it is only available to us through Jesus. So if you trust as Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then yes, you are righteous and your path is level and smooth. See, God is, is not out to get us. Our, our, we see right here, our path is not full of snarls and traps. And when we trust that God is not out to get us, when we trust that God is our ally, third point, we can wait on him more joyfully. We can wait. I wish we were all together in a room because I would ask you just to, to raise your hands if you felt like you were in a season of waiting right now. I feel like most people would feel like they're waiting for vaccines to be distributed more quickly. They're waiting for schools to open. They're waiting for a job. Some people are still waiting to conceive a child, to have a child, for a illness to be, or illness to be healed, illness. See, when we trust God as our ally, we can wait on him more joyfully. What does that mean? What does it mean to wait on God? It means that we trust his timing. We do not rush ahead to try to take care of things ourselves in ways that may or may not violate his, his laws and regulations and things that he's asked us or not asked us to do. We trust that he will act on our behalf in his own timing. We trust that he's a now or later, that he's a rock now and that he's gonna take care of the later. I have one child who moves really, really, really fast. Just everything is fast. And I used to say my child's name and then I would say, stop. And I realize that's, that's not being very rock-like, that's being a cactus. So now I say my child's name, wait, tell her to wait. And the other day we were making cookies and she kept wanting to like nibble at the dough, which everybody does, right? But I don't want her to get sick or get a stomach ache. So I tell her, wait. And what am I asking her to do in that moment? I'm asking her to trust me. I see what you're doing now, but I have something plan for you in 10 to 12 minutes as the cookies bake better down the line. I'm asking you to trust me now because I know what's going to happen later. And God, I'm sure has said the same thing to all of us, whether or not we're aware of it or not. He's asking us to trust him now because he will take care of the leader. And this 
this reframe, this reframe is important. And it's also, um, it's so important to praise God for who he is in this reframe. And when I say reframe, I say reframing our minds to who God is and that he is our rock and that he has already proven his trustworthiness to us in Jesus. And you might think, well, okay, so, so how do I wait, right? I want to trust God. I know that he's, um, he's already given me my eternal salvation, but how do I trust that a month from now, things are going to be okay. Things are going to feel different. See, I used to think that trust meant not being anxious about anything. And I'm, as I went through this, I learned that's, that's, that's not the case. Anxiety is a normal human emotion. Um, and I kind of laugh sometimes when I think about uh, Philippians 4, 6. It says, do not be anxious about anything. Um, because right now it feels like there's a lot of stuff to be anxious about. And I want to remind us two things here. I want to say that God has already taken care of our eternal salvation. So how much more does he want to care for our daily needs? He does, and he sees us right where we are. And I also want to remind you that it's okay to be anxious and that Paul says in Philippians 4, 8, that anxiety has something to do with our minds. He says, Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely or admirable or praiseworthy or excellent, says a lot of things there, Think about such things. Think about such things. Isaiah says it here in chapter 26. He says, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Him whose mind is steadfast. So I see things, peace, mind, trust. Three things that I see in that verse. So we feel anxiety when we let our minds become filled with anything else than God, right? Paul says, think about things that are lovely. Think about things that are excellent. Isaiah says, perfect peace when your mind is steadfast and you trust. We have to guard our minds right now. We have to guard our minds from this, the doom spiral, which is so easy right now. And I know you've heard a lot of this before, like you hear this in the context of what do you need to kind of, what walls you kind of need to put up or get out of your life, like get off social media, don't watch the news, like all these things that fill you with negativity, get rid of toxic people in your life, set up boundaries. And all of that stuff is really good. And I, I do truly believe that there should be boundaries around social media and about news and about the conversations you allow yourself to have with people but I want to think, flip it on its head a little bit today. And I want to think about things that we can add to our lives to guard our minds. Um, because it always feels good to be on the offensive, right? And what can we add as a defense for anxious thoughts? You know, some things that I've been doing lately are memory verses. I gave you guys a memory verse today. It's at the bottom of your outline, but I'll read it to you and you can write it down at Psalm 46, one, God is our refuge and our strength <clears throat> an ever present help in trouble. God is our refuge or our rock in strength and ever present help in trouble. Memory verses, daily mantras. Um, I don't necessarily like the word mantra, but I actually found one and this is a good example of how social media can bring some really good things. I found one on social media and I love what she said. And I've actually been saying this to myself and I'm just going to share it with you. And I've been saying it for the last week or so when I'm feeling anxious. And she says, I'm feeling anxious and overwhelmed. I have all the time I need. What needs to be finished will be. I will positively accomplish my intentions. Prayer of gratitude to God. Thank you for my body, my sight, my ears, my smell, my taste, my touch. 
Thank you for the gift of health and the angels who surround me and support me. Think about things that are excellent and praiseworthy and lovely. Let those voices drown out the anxious thoughts. You don't need to not acknowledge them and pretend that they don't exist. But think about things that are good. And as the more we do that, the more we seek God, the more we pray to him and praise him for who he is, that he is our rock, that he is our shelter, that he is our shade, our cloud. The more we reframe our mind to the end game, to know that <clears throat> when we trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have eternity to look forward to with our Heavenly Father and that we can afford to live a life of waiting right now because of that. And the more that we, we ask God to help us align our emotions with our, our head knowledge of who he is and what his word says us to do, the more we guard our minds by adding in memory verses and mantras and those relationships that continue to encourage you in your faith, we're 10 months into this pandemic. And I told one of my friends the other day, I feel like the effort to even connect with people outside of a virtual space feels like it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger because we're getting worse at connecting outside of online forums. And there's still a lot of fear around the virus. And there's still a lot of uncomfortableness like are you comfortable what are you comfortable with it's almost just easy to throw in the towel and be like i'm done until this is easy right we've got to keep seeking people who are going to encourage us in our faith <clears throat> i'm going to repeat my memory verses i leave you today and then say a quick prayer over us god is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help and trouble psalm 46 1 let god be your rock now he is our rock. We can trust him in the later. Let him be your now and later. Um, I'm going to say a quick prayer. And then I think the questions went out, right, Michelle? Two questions went out. You guys can talk amongst your groups. Um, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this time together today, Lord. And we just great, are, <clears throat> are grateful for your word and the words that you've given us here in Isaiah and that we could just Look at them today and see some hope and that even amongst what feels like such a challenging world, country, community, environment, God, that you are here and that you are present and that you are sovereign and that you reign, Lord. And we just ask that everybody who listens to me speak your words today would feel strengthened and emboldened and encouraged through your rock-like ability to be who you are to us, God. And we ask that you would help us see the end game here, to see our story's conclusion and know that it ends with you, God. And we ask, Lord, that, that you would just help our hearts align with our head's knowledge of who you are on a day-to-day -day basis as we're doing dishes, as we're working through conflict. And Lord, first or lastly, we just ask that you would guard our minds, God. That you would help us think about good things, that you would keep us out of the trap of thinking of what life should look like right now or what life could look right, look right now, look like right now, God, that you would just you would guard our minds there because we know that that is not the headspace you want us in right now, Lord. And God, I ask that you would just be with all of these discussions that we have and you would allow women to be vulnerable and messy and look like a hot mess. And in your precious son's name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for listening to me today and coming into my office with my husband's office with me. I now have a whole new appreciation for when he leads meetings over Zoom. Um, but I do see some of your faces and some of your smiles at me and I can't wait until we get to be together again in person. I just get giddy at the idea of us together in that sanctuary again. Thank you.